here. And yeah, just it felt very nostalgic hearing those introductions. Um, usually when I tune in for these from here in my tours, I often am running late and miss the intros and just hearing everyone's introductions and uh, especially rock at the front door. That was often something I was doing for Ottawa Civic Tech meetups back in the day. So it's just like, yes, the front door person, clutch skill uh, and a really fun time. Uh, I'm just going to pull up my little screen presentation thing with one too many Google Chrome tabs. Can everybody hear me okay on that side of things? So far, so good? All good? Just going to hope. Assuming yes. Excellent. Um, so yeah, really, yeah. Thanks to Olivia and Ayla and Alex and the whole team. It's really nice to be here. Uh, shout out to the Ontario Digital Service for hosting the in-person version. Um, huge fan of the ODS uh, for a whole bunch of reasons. Really awesome folks. And uh, yeah, maybe I'll just dive into my little presentation. Um, Alex and Gabe reached out uh, a few months back um, and I'm on parental leave right now. And I was like, oh yeah, sure, sounds great. Um, and then I was like, right, at some point while my little guy is napping, I need to make a presentation. Um, so this will maybe feel a little bit uh, ad hoc. Uh, and also I could talk forever about all these projects. So I'll try to keep it fairly fairly snappy, but I'm looking forward to, uh, to all your questions. Um, so I'm Sean, I'm a public servant and a web developer. I used to work for the federal government in Ottawa and then remotely from Whitehorse here in the Yukon where I live. Um, I now work for the Yukon government. Uh, and like I said, I'm on parental leave. Um, I'm lucky to have had a career that's like half public policy and half technology. Um, I always joke that I'm like, I was like, you know, the one kid who studied political science in a family full of engineers. And I feel like my parents doubted for many, many years if I would ever have a job. Um, and my older brother got me into web design when I was in high school, which turns out has been very useful um, in a whole bunch of ways. And my my goal in my public service career, um, really over the last like seven-ish years, has been to make public services and public service institutions better. Um, and I sort of joke both by like by normal means. Uh, and also by subversive means. If you've ever seen the like the D&D &D kind of like alignment chart thing, uh, chaotic good is my <laughs> preferred mode of operating. Um, and civic tech, and especially the civic tech community in Ottawa, has been a really big part of that. Um, and yeah, like I said, it was really, it was really uh, just, I felt a lot of warm fuzzies hearing everyone's intros, uh, especially in the in-person space, because back in 2016. This is where this all started for me was with Ottawa Civic Tech. Um, some of you might know Dan Monifu. He's in the blue, uh, the blue shirt there, who got it off the ground. It it was very directly inspired by Civic Tech Toronto that had been running for a few years or a couple years before that. Um, and I know for folks running the Civic Tech 101 presentation tonight, uh, we literally copied and pasted the Civic Tech Toronto one and made the Ottawa version. Same Tuesday meetup, same format. Um, very, very direct kind of inspiration. And similar to Toronto, the theme was really like, how can we use technology and design and thinking um, to contribute to public good? Uh, and because we were in Ottawa, a lot of the community was made up of federal public servants, not exclusively. There's a lot of other folks from like the private like tech industry and stuff. Um, but, you know, just living in Ottawa is sort of government related conversations, especially how can we make government better was like a very frequent topic. Um, and it was really a great source of, of connections and friendships with people, including, you know, some, some of my very closest friends, some people who are on the call today. Uh, so yeah, just a really nice community. And for me, sort of specifically, oh, if my slides will keep, there we go. Um, Civic Tech became a way to really explore from outside of work the same kinds of questions that I was exploring at my day job inside of government. So sort of like, how do you change government for the better, but in this case, from a different angle, almost like as a, like a pretend semi-pretend outsider um, and it was like civic tech was like a different hat that I could wear like oh you know over here this is like professional public servant Sean who's like writing emails and documents and going to public servant meetings and then this is like evenings and weekends civic tech person Sean with some like random side project that's also trying to shine a light on how government works or how it doesn't work or how it could work better um, and there's a lot of any of you who've worked in government will know there's a lot of limitations on how critical you can be you know, of the institutions that you work for. That's part of being a nonpartisan public servant. There's lots of like complications around that. Um, but for me, kind of in that sort of chaotic good kind of mentality, my, my own philosophy has been, unless we can have real conversations about things that are broken, it's really hard to make them better. Um, and over a number of years, civic tech for me was sort of this like protective 
very tiny protective cover for a lot of these projects that made it easier to kind of explore that space um, and subversive ways of making things better. So, you know, I'll, I'll jump right into the projects in a second, but just sort of as, as a theme that you'll see throughout a bunch of these, you'll see that a lot of these projects are basically like the exact same steps. It's like, take something that should have been a spreadsheet, like a bunch of government web pages or HTML tables or something, make it into a spreadsheet either by hand or by writing a web scraper or something like that. Uh, turn that spreadsheet into a website, usually with a bunch of, in my case, super iffy PHP code. It's like my one hammer for everything. Uh, and then a static site generator like Hugo, there's a bunch of cool tools for that. Uh, and then add just like a tiny bit of flavor or color commentary or interactivity or whatever, but not too much. Just like, you know, sometimes it's like almost none. It's just like, here are some numbers. Enjoy, no comment. Um, you know, basically so I didn't get fired. Um, and that's a joke because it's very hard to get fired as a public servant. Um, and but if you <laughs> if you have an awkward conversation with your manager about once a year, then you know that you're at the right amount. Um, that's also sort of a joke. Um, and yeah, there's like a second version of this which is pretty similar, which is basically find some obscure government report or disclosure, like a past access to information response or a publication from the House of Commons. Um, a very dear friend who's on this call is very good at finding stuff. Shout out to them. Uh, usually, it's, you know, I did not necessarily find these documents that so people would send them to me and be like, check this out. Um, then you extract the text from an incredibly janky scanned PDF that's like tilted. 90% of the time, they're like, someone printed this, put some stamps on it, and then rescanned it. And you're just like, that was not the best. Um, so sometimes you're OCRing stuff, like scanning things. Sometimes you're manually retyping them by hand. Um, and then it's back to the usual, which is turn that text into a website, uh, share it around. <laughs> Don't get fired. That's that's sort of like the general steps. Um, and yeah, you'll see both of these types of sort of themes in the projects coming up. Um, but the first one is actually not really either of those. This is just my very first sort of project of projectiness. Um, and it was shortly after starting, you know, joining the federal government. Before that, I'd worked for a tech startup as a software developer for three years. And of course, I get to work and I'm handed this like, you know, it's a Surface tablet, but it is so locked down that you can't do anything. And I was just like, oh, okay, these are computers that we have. I'll just swap over to it if you'll see this. Um, and so it was 2016, this is before Twitter became terrible. Um, and I was just like, all right, you know, <laughs> every single day I'm running through some weird error message. It's impossible to understand. Uh, I'm just gonna take screenshots of all of them. And then in December, like three months into my job, I started a Twitter feed that every single workday published uh like a screenshot of these things and you just see it's, it's like oh here's like internet explorer not working or like the pay and leave system not working or the software update system not working or you know not enough ram to load an image phoenix which many of you know if you're a public servant not working outlook not working this is my favorite windows problem reporting not working and you're just like what does that mean um and it was sort of funny because this is just a way to almost you know rather than it was, it was really almost to sort of just like maintain my sanity dealing with it, like not great government technology uh because then instead of being frustrated whenever i saw some new error message i was like oh my gosh it's a new one this is amazing like screenshot 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 um so it was a lot of fun and uh several years later basically well actually very shortly afterwards we figured out a way to procure macbooks for all of our team because we were hiring like software developers and designers to the canadian digital service where i worked um, turns out if you just say that they're for graphic design, <laughs> there's like a channel for communications shops to occasionally buy Apple hardware. So, and we published a blog post about it. Um, and yeah, just like that was sort of exploring the space of, you know, critical commentary. Cause if you look at it, it's like, as a public servant, you're not supposed to criticize your employer, but I'm just like, here's some screenshots, you know, there are no words. There should have been all text, but you know, things I've learned since then is just like a bunch of screenshots and it's like, Maybe I really like my work computer. I mean, you, who knows? Like, it could be great. But of course, if you look at this, they're all error messages uh, or just like really janky user interfaces. Um, so yeah, just like exploring that space of how critical can you be as a public servant um, and, uh, and sort of shining a light on things that could be better. This is the first sort of real project that came out of a conversation early on uh, with Auto Civic Tech. Uh, and it's a calculator for the cost of meetings. Uh, and basically, all you do is you just choose some people. When I started, I was an EC4. Let's add some of those people to this meeting. Maybe we'll add some EC5 to 6s. Hello, manager people. Maybe we'll add a couple of government executives. And then you just start a timer. And it's like, how much does this meeting cost? And you can see it 
tallying up over here on the corner. Hopefully this is all sharing okay. And you can also set the time, you know, if it's like an hour long meeting, it's like, oh, that's a $500 meeting. That's a lot. And it's, again, if you're in the public service, you'll have all these experiences where it's like, oh, if you want to buy some stationery, it is a multi-month process to get that approved for like 30 bucks of Staples office supplies. But if you're having a meeting, you know, <laughs> $500 meeting or $1,000 meeting, no one really bats an eyelid. And so this is like a funny conversation that we had at one of the Civic Tech meetups. And I was like, huh, well, that doesn't seem too hard to build. Basically, you just take the salary data that's in all of the collective bargaining agreements, which is printed on the web in these really confusing tables. Uh, but really, in our case, you just want sort of like the most recent one, like the sort of lowest and highest amounts. And then, like I said, you turn it into a, a spreadsheet, or in this case, a CSV file. Um, it's also kind of funny because you learn a lot about different sort of jobs and roles that are out there. If you really want to make a lot of money, sorry, there's EC4s. Um, you become a government and council appointee, which I assume is like being like the president of the Bank of Canada or Canada Post or via rail. They probably are like mid tier. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, just kind of fun. And then you make a spreadsheet and then you make a website. Uh, this is the next one. Uh, this one is actually still active and I still get emails from people that they're using it, which is really lovely. Um, this is another sort of around that theme of public servant access to modern technology. This is a website where it's sort of just like a crowdsourced list of which online services you can access in different federal government departments. And basically what it is, is um, just like, <laughs> I added a scoring thing. Cause I was like, I want, I want someone to be like, huh, who's the lowest and who's the highest to sort of in my head, create some competitive pressure between departmental CIOs, et cetera, to like be at like a higher performing department instead of a lower performing department. RSMP has a negative score. FinTrack, which recently got hacked, has also a negative score. So their low score doesn't help them. Um, and yeah, you basically can just go through and see if you wanted to use Zoom to chat with people in a different department. You just go find Zoom and you're like, oh, if you're at the Canada, Canada Revenue Agency, some people have access to Zoom, but not other people. Um, but you could use WebEx, if anyone still uses WebEx, it's the worst. Um, that one's not blocked. Um, and you can also look it up sort of by service and you, you can just go through the list of departments. Um, and it was really, again, sort of out of these questions of if these things are available in some departments, but not other departments, why is that? If they're safe to use in most departments, how come this random department, some agriculture department or whatever is blocking it. And it's like, it, it was just like a way to prompt those questions and try to sort of raise the bar for what tools people had access to. And again, you know, start with sort of like a website that lets people submit stuff. This is like the online forum where you can choose kind of a service and what's what's blocked or not. Um, and it just makes a spreadsheet. And of course, this is before I learned about tidy data. So it's just a bunch of columns going left to right. Uh, and me just tracking it based on the stuff that came in with a tiny bit of like editorial commentary of like if someone submitted it and like 100% of things were blocked or 100% of those things were open be like what's the someone just sort of fiddling with it but by and large it's been really rigorous kind of submissions from people there's no way for me to check them but you can tell that it's consistent when I get a few from the same department and uh, yeah uh, I've gotten a lot of really nice emails from people saying that they found it useful I have gotten a very small number of <laughs> not hate mail but sort of like cranky emails one from a director of IT security in a large department which made my day i was like this is amazing this is the best email i've ever gotten this is a very angry email about the website um yeah and this is just, I'll, maybe i'll skip through this i know i have more stuff to talk about than time uh, but again this is just again taking a spreadsheet and making it a website where the spreadsheet is very confusing but the real number i wanted to know is how many online service how many government services can you access all the way through online and the answer is about one out of five as of 2021 um and again this is just taking a thing making a spreadsheet, taking the spreadsheet, doing some pivot tables. Transport Canada has 100 services. One is available online from start to finish. Um, so there's a lot of work to do in government tech. Um, another one taking a report that was one of the best reports I've ever seen inside of government. Um, a bunch of public servants in 2015 and 2016 looked at ways that they could improve how internal, internal systems like procurement and staffing work. It's an amazing report. And I was like, this is amazing. How come I never heard about this? How come you can't even read it unless you're in government? Turns out someone else had already A-tipped it. And so I made a website that made it easier to use so that it's easier to read than this. Uh, unfortunately, all the images, this is not just Zoom. They are straight up pixels. Um, and uh, this is the downside of A-tip is that it's not a very high quality uh, 
artifact process. Um, this is another one along the theme of taking a similar like documents that are publicly available but just hard to decipher. Um, this is one that's been really interesting in the context of a lot of the more recent controversies around government procurement. Um, and it is basically a table from several years worth of extracts of Government of Canada um, IT projects, either ongoing or planned, that are over a million dollars. And you just look at the list and you're just like, wow, these are very large projects. $187 million, sort of it's really small, $163 million for $64 million. Um, and the way this came together is that opposition politicians at some point, um, nope, just to make sure I'm not running out of time. Oh, okay, sweet. Uh, also, yes, that is B612. Shout out to the fellow typography nerds. Um, basically, uh, whoop, sorry, go back. Whoop, shouldn't have gotten distracted by the chat, but I want to make sure I didn't run out of time. Um, this is what it looks like when opposition MPs ask the government how many projects are larger than a million dollars. It comes back as a very hard to read PDF, including a line that goes through almost every single page that would break text uh, OCRing, which is when you're trying to turn back into normal text. Um, and so most of this I copied and pasted one cell at a time into a spreadsheet. Uh, um, but what was really cool is that if you look at this, the same question was asked once in 2016, again in 2019. And then I was like, dear someone, tell a friend, tell a friend, tell a friend to email opposition members of parliament to ask it around the exact same time in April to May of 2022. And they did. And then we had three three data points asking the same question, which is the only way to tell, did IT projects finish? Are they still going? Um, did the cost of the same project increase? Uh, and the answer is often they did. This is the record setter, which is a passport modernization program, which originally had a budget of $28 million. And as of 2022 had a budget of $187 million, which is a 500% increase. And it's like, if you just read this, that is not visible, but if you have a couple of years of data to compare, then you can find some really interesting stuff. Um, and it's really interesting nowadays when you've got, for example, very politically controversial things like ArriveCan, and you're just like, oh man, that is a measly $46 million. Although I think in practice now it's the new estimate is like $54 million, but still $54 million is not a lot when the largest ones, uh, ah, oh, right. <laughs> when the largest ones are actually uh, airplanes. One year in 2016, they did not do this for the later versions, but National Defense or the Department of National Defense included some data on IT projects, which presumably there are some IT things or electronics involved in upgrading an airplane. Um, but defense stuff is so different that I'm just like, right, what am I actually interested in? Uh, yes, benefits to delivery modernization, $400 million. Uh, something from the Border Services Agency, they have had a hard run, $415 million. $383 million of random stuff at Cherry Services. And then you look at that and you're just like, Arrive Can, it's not that big. Um, so this, this is, this, <laughs> the friends that I worked on with this, we were very stoked when this all came together. Um, and again, is literally just turning that giant report into a spreadsheet and then making up my own little unique sort of codes to identify them so that I could match the same project over multiple years. Um, and uh, yeah, this is again, this is the, the one that at Auto Civic Tech, we worked on this for four years, three or four years, um, with a whole bunch of us working on it together. And this is sort of started from a fairly simple question, which is basically before any of these IT controversies or outsourcing or procurement, whatever controversies, basically we just want to know like, how much does the government spend on a given large IT company? Like if you were to be like IBM, how much does the government spend on IBM? And the answer was, it is really hard to tell because at that time, Basically, the only way you could look stuff up is like one contract or contract amendment at a time on these pretty clunky old web pages. This is from like 2016 or 2017 that are like, here's the name of the vendor, here's the contract date. Further down, there's like the dollar value, something around software. Um, but fortunately, the open government team um, at TBS in the federal government, which are like my heroes, they had just started collecting all of this in one CSV. Um, and they've done some amazing work to kind of clean this up over the years. Uh, but the the departments that submit it always submit some stuff with some pretty like <laughs> just like IBM spelt 80 different ways. Uh, and so a lot of the project was involved in like both making scrapers for those old web pages like this. Like I think we wrote like 30 or 35 or 39 different web scrapers that were all very similar, but just different enough. Um, and then a bunch of data that came from this. Um, but the the tricky part was that the historical data 
from the web pages didn't often show up in the CSV file. It was like departments just like started new data. Um, and that looked like this. Um, and we knew we were onto something when we just sort of started putting it all together on charts and we realized if you've heard of something in government, which is basically at the end of the government fiscal year, oftentimes people are like, we have some extra money left over. We need to like finish this up, otherwise we'll lose our budget for next year. So in March, when the government fiscal year is ending, oftentimes people buy a bunch of random office chairs or other stuff. Uh, and here on the chart, we're just like, wait a minute, Q4, that's March-ish. Look at this, you just see all these spikes every March. And there's a name for this, which people call March Madness. And I'm just like, man, I can't believe it just literally showed up the first time we put this into a table. That's crazy. Um, and uh, and yeah, there's a lot more sort of methodology behind this uh, and a bunch of charts that are kind of fun. Um, but what was neat about that, we worked on that as a, as a team for a number of years. I wrote a bunch of incredibly gnarly PHP code to analyze the data, which friends who are real data, data scientists were like, Sean, that's not a great choice. And I was like, this is my only hammer. Watch me hammer all these whatever the metaphor is around nails. Um, but I had the chance to come back to this uh, a couple summers ago as part of a research exchange thing, uh, working with Professor Amanda Clark at Carleton University in Ottawa. Um, and it was such a joy to be able to come back to the same project from essentially like the, like, <laughs> I was gonna say academic rigor minus my poor R skills, uh, R as a data science language. Um, and we did the same thing. And this basically looks like this where you can find you know, for example, here's IBM. In 2021 to 2022, the government spent about $476 million just on IBM. Um, and you can kind of look this up by different categories, uh, by department. If you look at IT, you can look it up by like, oop, if it'll load, um, like IT consulting versus software versus devices and like servers and laptops and stuff or like telecommunications. Um, and it's just really fun to be able to come back to this and sort of build on a civic tech project from an academic kind of standpoint. And um, yeah, also it's just crazy if you put them all on charts. Um, <laughs> because it spends a lot of money on IT companies. Here's IBM, here's Bell, here's Microsoft, here's Deloitte, they're very prominent. Here's Oracle, my secret nemesis. And uh, yeah, and here's, oh yes, here's Deloitte by year. Probably just doing like auditing in 2017. Now they're making $120 million just in IT consulting every year. Um, yeah, I'll wrap it up here. I've probably gone over time. Um, but yeah, Civic Tech has just been a really, a really nice um, sort of world to explore sort of as, as a public servant who can only, you know, you can only do certain things within the sort of confines of your day job. But it gave me a chance to look at these things from a different angle, you know, from sort of like publicly available information, sort of like arranging and playing with it in different ways. Um, there's a community, like an amazing community of people, both in, in Ottawa and Toronto and around Canada, of people to learn from. Um, I often joke, and it's true that I'm just like, I am a pretty mediocre web developer, a really bad data scientist, a really bad like UX designer. But just by using, you know, using those skills and bringing them together and learning from people who are much better at the, those things than I am, um, it's fun to be able to build stuff. And it's fun to be able to, you know, explore cool ideas uh, and put things together uh, and have people you know, visit the website and be like, this is so helpful or this is so interesting. Um, something I've gotten a lot of joy from. So love, would love to hear any questions. Appreciate you all listening to me kind of ramble on about nostalgic projects. And um, yeah, feel free, feel free to give a shout anytime. I'll, uh, I'll share these, share the, oh, I should have done this at the start actually, share the, the slides and the links to stuff here. And um, yeah, would love to hear all your thoughts. Thanks so much. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully y'all could hear me as I'm just rambling on for 20 minutes. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, go ahead, Paul. Hey, everyone. Sorry, I <clears throat> also did the the introduction earlier, but um, but it's okay. Uh, I Sean and I used to work together. Um, Sean, I'm curious that like you've showed these projects off. You've kind of hinted at 
you know, some people that I've worked with or some people reach out to me, maybe it's like, maybe I should do this. Maybe I shouldn't be doing this. I'm curious what you think about the, like, maybe like the impact of this work versus, um, I guess if we were to make it sort of a binary, you could say, mm -hmm. okay, sometimes you can call attention to a problem by pointing out like, hey, it's blocked in my department.com. Or sometimes you could say, I'll email the department, I'll talk to the people internally. You know, maybe there's a false binary there, but I, I wonder like, how do you think about that? Like now that you're in the Yukon of like, do you think that your enduring value, that these projects have had enduring value, that it was kind of worth doing them? Or do you think that the like the day-to-day -day of like being there every day and kind of going through the emails and talking to people. Like that's I'm a great, curious, like how you make impact in government. Basically. Yeah, that's a great question. I I don't I don't think I know. Sort of like, yeah, like how do you tell if you're having more impact in your sort of day job of like being like a sort of more by the book public servant versus like having more impact as like a subversive side project, civic tech person? Um I, I don't know. I think like it's nice to think that some of these websites and projects have had a, like some kind of impact, but I'm like, I think most of it is selfishly. It's for me to sort of scratch those itches so that when my day job is like overly constraining or confined, like I have like a weekend thing to do to like be like, okay, if my day job is stuck and not going anywhere fast, at least I've got these side projects. Um, and then if you like run out of steam on side projects, you're just like, well, maybe my day job is like now moving better. Um, I think it's, I think it's hard to say which one has more impact in any given moment, or if like if any of these have had like a pretty like big or small impact. But it's just like it's like my my philosophy in my head is always just like, why not try both? <laughs> like, <laughs> see, see what happens. But yeah, it's a really good question. I think is this blocked? Is, is this blocked in my department? Is probably the only one that I would say maybe has had some kind of impact because I think people use it to make the case to unblock stuff in the department that they're in um, by being like, look, 26 other departments don't block Slack, but ours does. Why is that? Um, so I think that's useful. But the other ones, the other ones, I I always wish that the large Government of Canada IT Projects website that has like that list of like $400 million, $300 million, like I wish that one had gotten more eyeballs on it just when whenever government IT projects are in the news because it just gives a gives a perspective of how like you know how big big numbers are i guess or how big how small small numbers are compared to them it's, you really lose perspective i don't know and paul paul knows this too it's just like you see these giant government canada it projects and you're just like i used to know if a million dollars was a lot of money or not and now it's hard to tell like if this is like in someone's bank account as a person that's a lot but if it's an it project a million dollars is tiny which is a weird thing to think um yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Actually, yes. Um, maybe one of the organizers can kind of queue up questions between in the room and online. Um, but yeah, <laughs> Paul, it's a great question. <laughs> Paul and I have a lot of conversations around like, is our work having impact? Are our side projects having impact? It's a. It's hard to know. Is anyone in the room have a question? Can you take the mic here yeah. so I can vote? Yeah, I'm just gonna toggle this again. Uh, thanks for the great talk. I uh, was just curious, are you tracking, so I guess you're tracking sort of the contractors and also the amounts. Are we, is there any sort of record keeping of which contractors tend to go over budget? And is that trickling down into the decision making in government from your position? Ooh, that is a that's good, that's oh, sorry if it's echoing. Um, that is a good question. I do not know if it is trickling down into any kind of uh, government decision making. If you go onto the the newer one, um, the govcanadacontracts.ca website, if you click on a vendor, I don't have the screen sharing up anymore, but you can see kind of like the average number of contracts that have amendments that increase the value. Um, so for example, for like IBM Canada, that's just like prominently at the top of the list, um, about 20% of their contracts have had at least one amendment. Um, and those amendments are, uh, says of contracts with amendments, this is just me reading my own webpage, uh, the average increase in dollar value was 12, 1200%, <laughs> which makes me doubt my own math. Um, and the average number of amendments was two and a half. So you can see, you can see per vendors what the sort of tendency is around amendments, because that was one of the questions that when we were doing the research project we were interested in. Um, 
and if you if you look at the sort of data behind it um, in the R code, those you can see where those numbers are generated, um, and it's analyzing individual contracts and the amendments that it's matched back to them. Um, but yeah, to what extent different vendors are more likely to sort of be recurring, like having co like contracts be amended upwards more or less. Um, I don't believe that that's tracked or used for any sort of future decision making, but it should be. One of the things that other countries have done much more than the federal government here in Canada is sort of vendor performance monitoring. Um, I believe there's a pilot going on right now in the federal government to like start looking at that, but it's it feels sort of obvious that you would track if vendors do a good job or not, but that's a delicate thing to do. Um, so, so yeah, I don't think it's ever been done at a large scale in the federal government. But that's not <laughs> even my professional hat was not directly related to that. So just watching that from a distance and being like, should we? We should keep. Someone should keep track of this. This seems useful. Thank you. Uh, we're short on time, so maybe we'll take one or two more. Hi. Uh, so I'm an ex-public servant myself, not for Canada, but for New Zealand, but all of the issues I faced in that were very identical to those that you touched on here, especially with websites being blocked and so on. And um, as someone who was hired as a UX designer to help implement changes to online services, it was part of an IT project. I, in my experience, it was like leading IT projects and, and building out products like that. And folks that would be, would of course be working in the private sector where the pay, the pay is just so much more competitive and they would have no incentive to be essentially hired on into public spaces. So uh, I guess I'm curious, uh, I know you touched on how uh, there's now like a trial going out, like vendor performance, because now all these projects are we rely on vendors to build them out instead of like mm -hmm. our own in-house or other in government capability. Uh, did you find uh, from your own experience working or from your research project that it was a matter of talent that was in, uh, contributing to the lack of good IT projects? Yeah, it's a great, it's a really, really good question. Um, I think, I think all the things that you touched on are, are part of it. Um, over the last few years, I think, yeah, um, it's just a great question. Like, like, <laughs> why is the government so bad at getting in-house expertise? Why are government online services typically as bad as they are, um, are all kind of connected? And I think talent and being able to hire talent is a really big part of that. When uh, Professor Clark and I did this research analysis on government contracts, we wrote um, partly from the sort of data that we were looking at, and partly just from what other countries have done, we wrote a sort of guide on reforming IT procurement. And part of that is like, the government should pay higher salaries for tech professionals that they can actually keep them um, and have people in-house. Because one of the things that that I think is really true is that if you, if you have such a shortage of in-house tech capacity, then you're not actually able to tell if vendors are doing a good job. Like some vendors are really great, some vendors are really terrible, but you need someone who understands technology and design to be able to kind of like look at those vendors work and be like, yes, this is a good job. No, they phoned it in. Like, we should drop these vendors and get different ones. Um, and for the federal government in Canada, like, that's that's a challenge for a long time. Um, and the Canadian digital service where I used to work, um, we had a lot of conversations about this, but we didn't really get a lot of traction in sort of, like, the broader government on how to change that. Um, and, yeah, I think, like, fewer barriers to hiring talent and having, like, both higher salaries and, like, more flexibility to work across Canada, I think, are really big things that that should change but haven't yet. We can take Wesley's question online. Um, sure. Hi. Um, forgive me. This is actually a really elementary question. I am new here, so <laughs> apologies. All good. Um, but uh, it was great to hear your presentation. Super interesting. Uh, one of the things that came to mind was like it seems like for the project that you've created, maybe especially like early on, like I think the you know, is this blocked in my department would seem like one of the kind of like earlier projects that you did. Um, you know, when you come up with these projects, how much do you think about like who the intended audience for these projects are? And then like, how do you get people to actually, you know, visit the websites you create or look at the data that you're presenting to them? Because like, I know that can be like a real challenge even in the private sector, right? But yeah. um, 
you know, like, especially starting out, if like, maybe, you know, your sort of like network of like-minded individuals was smaller, uh, or if you're targeting an audience that like, isn't necessarily in your sphere of influence, like, do you think about like, how do you actually get the people who need to see this data to actually pay attention? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, for some of them, I feel like I thought more about sort of like, who is the target audience and like, how do I sort of like design it for those folks th than others? Like some of them, like the Sean's work computer Twitter feed is just like, this is just me doing a thing for fun. Like it's, <laughs> no one sees it. That's also okay. Um, for is this blocked in my department? It was, you know, it was partly like that was, that was built when I was still in Ottawa and going to the, the civic tech meetups before, before we moved to Whitehorse. And that was really helpful because being able to both sort of like bounce ideas off of people there was really helpful. Like it was like, especially other public servants who were there. And, and that was sort of helpful to know sort of like what would be useful for people. The other thing that was really helpful for that is that website had a bit of a chicken and an egg problem of, you know, I only work in one department. I only know what my department has like blocked or not blocked. And so being able to get sort of insights from other people at civic tech meetups of like what was blocked in their departments was really helpful at the start because if I was like, hey, friends, I built this new web page to like check out what's blocking your department. And it's like, no data, no data, no data, no data. It's like no one would no one would come back to it like three months later once there theoretically was data. And so getting that sort of initial data to make the website useful, like that was partly thanks to folks that were in like in the room at Civic Tech Meetups. Um, but yeah, as far as as far as audience, like that to me is like, I think one of the things that I have always thought about with stuff that I'm building kind of just as like a default state is like m the thing that motivates me the most is when people like find a thing useful or like people go check it out or like share it with their friends and stuff like that which which is maybe like a bit of like a like vanity metric chasing but it's it's something that when I when I worked at a tech startup as sort of like the like poli sci student who's like moonlighting as a software developer all of my all of my actual computer science grad colleagues they'd be like oh i just did this database opt like optimization like it's like 0.2 percent faster and i'm just like that's that's cool for me like i want to build like user interface things that like people are actually like oh i tried the new feature and it like made it work so much faster than the old one like that's sort of like the human interface part of web development and software development is like the thing that i found or that i still find the most enjoyable and so you're kind of thinking about audiences in the sense of like what does a good interface look like or what does like good ui look like again with like <laughs> just me as like a total amateur like trying to do that um but that was sort of that's always been sort of like a thread of like what will people find the most useful? What will people find the most interesting? Um, even if like who exactly the audience is, it's sort of hard to predict beforehand. Um, and then for other ones, like for the large government of Canada IT projects, um, this is sort of like a funny thing to explore as a public servant, because for me, it's like, I'm a neutral, like nonpartisan public servant. I can't just like phone up a, like a member of parliament or like a politician and be like, hey, look at this giant IT project, it's so controversial, like you should look into this. It's like, I, that's not appropriate, but I can make a web page that's just like, look at all of the giant IT projects. Here it is with no like political commentary. Um, and so the secret audience for a bunch of these is like journalists, members of the media, like actual politicians who might otherwise not be paying attention to like the very deep in the weeds kind of ins and outs of government technology. Um, and so, just by making a thing that is publicly available to everyone that allows you to reach people that if you were directly kind of like trying to like reach out to them, like in, in the sort of confines of being a public servant in Canada, like would not have been appropriate. So that's always the secret agenda is like, I want everyone to see this, especially decision makers, but I can't talk to them directly. So I'm just going to put it on the internet. Um, so that's, that's a different flavor of the same kind of question, like who's the audience. But yeah, great question for sure.